जय गुरुजी नमस्ते गुरुजी गुरुजी के चरणों में कोटि कोटि प्रणाम जय गुरुजी संगत जी अ वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू टुडे वी आर फॉर्चुनेट इनफ टू गैदर अगेन गैदर हियर येट अगेन फॉर अनदर रीडिंग ऑफ ब्लेसिंग रेडी फॉर डिविनिटी बाय अ वेरी ओन डियर कमांडर अंकल संगत जी आप सब एग्री करेंगे चैप्टर बाय चैप्टर जैसे ही हम ब्लेसिंग्स ऑल ब्लेसिंग्स रेडी फॉर डिविनिटी पढ़ते जा रहे हैं हम सबके कितने सत्संग अलाइव होते जा रहे हैं आई एम श्योर आप सब रिलेट कर सकते हैं मेरी तरह कितने सत्संग जो आ, अंकल के उस टाइम के हैं जब गुरुजी महाराज अपने फिजिकल फॉर्म में थे अंकल को वही सब एक्सपीरियंस हुए हैं जो आज हमें हो रहे हैं सो इज इंट इट अ वेरी ब्यूटिफुल वैलिडेशन बाय गुरुजी महाराज हिमसेल्फ एंड आई कैन नॉट प्रोसीड फर्दर बाय नॉट थैंकिंग कमांडर अंकल फॉर दिस अगर कमांडर अंकल जैसी संगत ऐसी बुक्स नहीं लिखे महाराज के गुणगान ना करें हमें अपना महाराज के लाइफ टाइम का एक्सपीरियंस नहीं शेयर करें तो हम में से बहुत लोग चाहते ना चाहते कहीं ना कहीं एक वैलिडेशन के लिए भटकते रहे सो माय वेरी हम्बल थैंक्स टू कमांडर अंकल सुरेश अंकल थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर इनिशिएटिंग दिस इनिशिएटिव एंड ऐसी सेवा इतनी अच्छी आप सेवा करते हैं मल्टीलिंगुअल ग्रुप के द्वारा और हमें भी इसका हिस्सा बनाते हैं थैंक यू वेरी मच एंड गुरु महाराज कि हम पे बहुत रहमो करम है उनकी बहुत रहमत है कि वो हमें इतना अलाउ करते हैं कि हम ये शब्द गुरुजी महाराज जिसमें पूरा ब्रह्मांड समा जाता है उस एक शब्द को हम अपने मुंह से ले सकें हम तुच्छ प्राणी इसके भी काबिल नहीं है ये महाराज की हम पर बहुत दया दृष्टि है कि वो हमें मौका देते हैं वो हमें जागरूक कराते हैं कि हम उनका नाम ले सके उनकी शरण में आ सके और इस तरह के ग्रंथ पढ़ सके थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू गुरु जी महाराज विद दिस आई वेलकम गिना आंटी जो आज आ, हमारे बीच में हैं और वो चैप्टर ब्लेसिंग्स ऑलवेज आई एम नॉट लीविंग माय संगत इसकी रीडिंग एंड नरेशन करेंगी गिना आंटी थैंक यू वेरी वेरी मच फॉर एक्सेप्टिंग द सेवा and giving us the blessed opportunity to listen to the reading of this divine chapter over over to you aunty jai guru ji jai guru ji maharaj jai guru ji sangat ji i thank guru maharaj for bestowing this seva of reading of chapters from the divine book called blessings ready for dignity divinity authored by commander uncle thank you sri shankar for making me a part of This platform where I am today, and it is because of you and Guruji and the Sangat that I am now connected very well with Guruji. So, without further ado, I would start reading of the chapter "Blessings Always." I am not leaving my Sangat. It was a normal day. I was heading off for a round of golf in the morning. some time before 6 o'clock when i got a call from singla uncle guruji was not well he told me adding that the gurgaon sangat should pray for him all kinds of thoughts overwhelmed my mind guruji is our lord and master he takes care of us we are because of him he is not well and we are supposed to pray for him it somehow didn't add up the reversal implicit in the situation made me think it was some kind of a test guru ji had thrown at us i came home and sent a message to the gurgaon sangat via sms each devotee i later came to know quietly did job this continued for about half an hour to 45 minutes i got another call and was told that there is no need for the job to continue any more i thought maybe the test was over i sent a message to devotees effectively saying all is well stop praying please stop praying after some time i got a call 
this time from a close friend and devotee who just said, Bhai Ji, Guru Ji is gone. Before I could latch on to the meaning, he added that Guru Ji was no more. I was standing next to the kitchen with my wife. I turned to her and repeated the words. She rushed to me, held me in a tight hug and said, what will happen to us? Numbed to the bones, all I could mumble was, I have no idea. It was life's worst moment. Everything was lost. I was unable to come to terms with what I had been told. Then I got a follow-up message that Maharaj is at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. I rushed there. Already word had spread and Sangat had started gathering there. There was no need to ask anyone. Their faces said it all. I remember Guruji Sangat scattered around outside in tears. Everyone was trying hard to come to terms with what had just happened. The whole complex was full of his fragrance, not just the room, not just the corridor. The whole institute was full of his fragrance. As if in a trance, I walked towards the ICU. Nobody was there and I was standing there lost. One uncle came out of the ICU and asked me if I wanted to have Guruji's darshan one last time. I went inside. Guruji was on a hospital bed. I held his feet, which was sockless. With both my hands and put my head on them for one last time. At Empire Estate, Guruji had always worn socks and I had wondered if I would ever get a chance to hold his feet when they were not clad in socks. I had thought that such a blessed moment would never come and at the very last moment, Maharaj had fulfilled this cherished desire too. But it came with so much sorrow. We all hoped Guruji would get up, that this was his Leela. We thought that he loved his Sangat so much, he would not leave them. Looking back, he never did. I had his last darshan in the physical form on May 26, 2007, the Saturday before May 31st. Devotees were taking Agya to go home and I must have been eighth or ninth in the line with as many devotees behind me. Guruji leaned to the left, looked at me and said, Commander, go home. I would have loved to touch his feet, but because of his Agya, I bowed from a distance, did not even gaze at him and walked away with absolutely no idea of what Maharaj had planned for himself and his Sangat. For quite some time during the preceding months, we had heard talks about Guruji's plan to go. In fact, in May 2007, he told a number of Sangat that he was here only up to the end of the month. I, like most others, assumed that Guruji would perhaps move to Punjab, where he was known to be very happy and relaxed. That was clearly not the case when he was in Delhi. I shared my thoughts with my wife that we would not be able to see him every Saturday. Instead, we would go to Punjab at least once a month. My wife agreed. I also remember how Guruji had responded to a couple who came to Guruji towards the very end of May. Guruji asked them if this was their first visit <clears throat> and they said yes. They were late in coming to him, he pronounced. He was going. The Sangat around him asked him where he was going but he didn't answer the question. Later, it all added up. The memory of Guruji leaning to the side, looking at me and ordering me to go home is still indelibly etched on my mind. I regret that I could not ever get to touch his feet and press them as I won't want to do, but I am happy that he called out my name. Now I ask myself why I hadn't looked up for that one eye contact at what was going on to be our last moment together. This habit of keeping my eyes low and not looking at Maharaj had come cost me dear, so to say. This was not resting my head on his feet one last time haunts me to date. I asked Guruji why he had not allowed it even as I consoled myself with the thought that he called me out saying commander. For quite some time, the devotees grieved. 
for my wife guruji came in her dream on may 30th 2007 she saw guruji seated in the center of the hall not on his asana but in the very clothes he wore on the la very last day she wanted to sit next to guruji instead he asked her to go outside she was not happy and then guruji told her again you go out and do seva the people who are sitting with me here are sick she reluctantly went out maharaj had gone and gone without warning in the starkness of our grief we felt a huge void our world had literally collapsed there was an unvoiced feeling that this was the end of our beautiful association slowly our perception changed his fragrance never left us and could be felt at the mandir in the lawns in the surrounding in the environs even more intensively than ever before every gust of the wind would bring back bring it back to reassure us of his presence it was unforgettable at bara mandir my wife met a lady devotee paul auntie who grabbed her and gave her a tight hug crying and wondering what would happen to her family now that guruji was gone we were like kids whose mother had left them suddenly all helpless that night my wife dreamt she was at a satsang guruji appeared from behind a curtain which was close to his my wife looked at him and exclaimed guruji you are here guruji said then what you guys are thinking i'm gone i'm here i have not gone anywhere else and that paul auntie she was crying she doesn't know that i'm here you go and tell her that i'm here i am not going anywhere i am not leaving my sangat it was much later that my wife met paul auntie she told her what guruji had proclaimed very slowly devotees realized that maharaj had not left them yes he just didn't look and feel the way he used to at that time but the intensity of his presence everything about him has multiplied many fold slowly the sangat began to feel normal again most devotees got his darshan in their dreams the devotees who joined the sangat later began getting blessed at a rate that was phenomenal some old devotees like me even wondered why they never had that kind of instantaneous deliverance into faith and kinship with guruji in private conversations the new sangat often tells us that we the old sangat have been very lucky to have seen guruji in physical form that indeed is true but the old sangat had connected with guruji's physical presence and become much attached to it when this presence was lost it was as if we had lost one of our parents the realism of his philosophy sorry the realism of his physicality is not something that can be made up for a long for as long as we are operating via our physical body for most of us the opportunity of being near him to be the same in the same room breathing the very air he breathed to be able to touch his feet to be able to listen to his voice to have him look at us with love and grace is extremely hard to let go in a certain sense we the old sangat live with this sense of loss the new sangat has already connected to the divine to lord shiva without having these memories to grapple with though his leap into the beyond took us by surprise in retrospect it is clear that guruji had planned it well in advance for around year 2005 when i was stopped taking his leave maharaj told me to write down my satsang and hand it over to sumit chetra ankur i did not know what it was meant for but i dutifully com com complied very soon we realized that a granth was being compiled with experiences of sangat guruji had chosen to be included the satsangs were compiled into a book titled light of divinity which came out on guruji's birthday in year 2007 it is his abiding blessing for all of us and future generations of devotees but this is very unusual because mentioning maharaj in print or electronic media was not permitted till then second his exhortation to us to bring more devotees to him to bless had a significance 
an announcement was made that Guruji wanted to bless even more Sangat and we should get new Sangat to connect with Guruji. We should do satsang and bring people to Maharaj so that he could bless them. He wanted to bless as many as he could. As old Sangat, we found the, that Empire Estate was getting crowded with devotees and we were getting edged out. New devotees took up the ground floor hall where Guruji sat and old devotees were sent to the first floor, depriving them of darshan and were asked to come infrequently. As more and more people came in, the old devotees were squeezed out. An incentive was given to them. They could come more than once if they were accompanied by a new Sangat. We would strive to get hold of people, share our satsangs and have them come to Guruji, enticing them with an offer of an out of the world langar. Finally, the third indication was a yearly calendar that was distributed to the Sangat for the very first time. Rashmi Aunty had been requesting Guruji Maharaj to permit her to print calendars for the Sangat every year since 2002 onwards. Guruji never gave his permission all those years and that was that. Early in the year 2007, one day in Empire State, she got four identical swaroops of Guruji and requested Maharaj to sign each one of them on the front. Guruji happily obliged by signing all of them with blessings always Guruji. She later used one of those four signed swaroops to print two calendars for her personal use and brought these to Maharaj for his blessings. Guruji Maharaj was very pleased with the way the calendars had turned out. He sought Rashmi Singh auntie's opinion about printing them in large numbers for distribution amongst his Sangat. Exactly what auntie had been unsuccessfully requesting since the past five years. She got the calendars printed and for the first time they were distributed amongst the Sangat on Shivratri day, strictly one per family. Moreover, the calendar distribution continued up to perhaps April, May 2007. We know now that Maharaj's change of mind was clearly not a coincidence. He planned it. The widely used iconic signature Blessings Always Guruji that are so popular among Sangha these days belong to that very calendar of 2007. On the one hand, we do not have Guruji in his physical form with us today. On the other, we continue to feel his presence around us all the time. Additionally, we have his Sangat, his beautiful memories and this seva of sharing our divine moments with Guruji, with those who came to Guruji's Sharan later. Guruji is still here. His aura is here. His blessings are here. They haven't gone. Guruji did not hold our hand to let go of it. Once we realized this, the pain slowly eased off. It took a long time, but it eased off. His physical presence has gone, but his but he continues to live in our hearts and holds the reign of our chariots in his divine hands. That alone keeps us going on the right path. That is indeed a huge blessing and the only thing that matters. An episode of the Mahabharata illustrates this the best. When the great war was over with the Pandavas emerging victorious, Krishna asked Arjuna to dismount from his chariot first. Arjuna, out of sheer arrogance, he had won the war, after all, felt his charioteer should get off first and then help the victorious warrior dismount. He conveyed as much to Krishna. The Lord demurred, saying that today Arjuna would have to get off first, this time being an exception. He reluctantly complied, and then Krishna alighted from the chariot, which immediately went up in flames. It was gutted and reduced to ashes. Krishna then explained to Arjuna that Arjuna's chariot, chariot had been long reduced to ashes such as the severity of the attacks it had come under. The weapons that had assailed it were formidable. As long as he was sitting on it, the Lord explained it held together. If he had alighted from the chariot first, Arjuna would also have met the fate of the chariot. This story holds a mirror before us. Our body is the chariot and we reside in it. As long as Guruji is also sitting on this chariot, this chariot holds together. The struggles we faced would be reduced, would have reduced us to nothing, but since Guruji is controlling, guiding, protecting it, the chariot behaves normally and stays on track. Just don't let the Guru dismount your chariot and you will be okay. 
He is here by your side, the ultimate supreme power. My feelings is that Guruji Maharaj left his physical form only to move and live inside our hearts permanently. Thus ensuring he is never away from us, his Sangat even for a moment, always holding the rein of our chariot. We are so fortunate, my wife and I often ask ourselves how different our life has become since we took refuge in Guruji's lotus feet. How our quality of life has become imme immeasurably better. How happiness has come to our doors. How we have become prosperous, healthy, and socially respected. How our children are doing well out of the sheer power of his grace. Had we not come to his door, our lives would have languished, stale, damp, hurting, and hurtful in some dark corner. Every single time we ask ourselves this question, no matter how, we are still situated in life at that moment, we find that he is blessing us. His fragrance always comes to us. It reassuringly tells us, my children, I'm here. He is the one who keeps us going. Does not mean we do not have any problems and issues to resolve, far from it. We face challenges on a daily basis and fighting our way through. Having said that, there is a difference between then and now. We now have the very reassuring and benign presence of Maharaj in and around us that allows us to face with confidence whatever destiny throws at us. With this, I come to the end of this chapter. I shall now begin the next, which is how his grace makes light of karma. It is in truism with devotees that Guruji takes care of 90% of their karma. A meager 10% is left to handle and we find that, that even hard to handle. Still, the Guru makes that karmic ride easy to bear. Say you are fated to eat a kilo of red chilies. The punishment must be borne. If your guru is with you, then he will add one spoon of chili to a dish of chili paneer every day and have you eat it with naan. Thus the guru makes your karma palatable. Devotees wonder why we are puppets in the hands of the divine. They accumulate karma. How is it that we become responsible for actions purportedly initiated, controlled and executed by the divine? Saint Tulsi Das also wrote as, Ram Charitra, as much in Ram Charitramanas. Hoi so jo Ram Rachi Rakha ka kari tarak badhave saka. Which means everything happens as per the will of Ram. There is nothing to be gained by deliberating on it. As usual, Guruji always simplified complex matters. In the late night chant with chat with General Kapoor, Guruji asked him what he knew of various religions and the general admitted to knowing very little because he was a military man. Guruji reassured him, then rapidly recited divine <clears throat> axioms from the major religions and asked him what he had understood. When the general could only shrug in helplessness, Guruji told him not to worry. If he knew nothing, because it did not matter. Guruji then summarized the essentials, that all the religions are one and the same. God is one and all are his children. Thus, if we are able to do good for someone, we should go ahead and do it. It is okay and acceptable if we can't. Just make sure that we do not cause harm to anyone, that we do not become the reason for another's sorrow. We should not be responsible for anyone's tears, pain or suffering. As long as a person helps others when people, when possible, does no harm to anyone, then that's all one needs to know about religion. Of course, one should set apart time to connect with the divine creator to express gratitude for all the blessings received. There is no better discourse on karma than that of the Gita. The Gita is the story of two brotherly clans, the, the five Pandas and their hundred cousins, the Kauravas, led by Duryodhana, fighting for the kingdom. It is seen as, as the battle between the good and the evil. Lord Krishna stands on the side of good with the Pandavas. His army is with the Kauravas. At the commencement of the battle, Arjuna refuses to fight. 
this episode sets up the discourse of the Gita is known as the Vishada Yoga of Arjuna. When Arjuna sees that his cousins ranked against him on the field of battle, he is dismayed and objects that those he, those he is fighting against are his family. He turns to Krishna, who has taken up the key role of his charioteer and says he doesn't want to kill his brothers, uncles, grandfathers and teachers. He won't wage a war against those whom he has ties by blood. So saying, Arjuna sits disconsolately in the chariot, keeping aside his famous bow, the Gandava. Krishna, who is also Arjuna's guru, has to prepare a reluctant disciple to go to war. And this war is not just Arjuna's alone. This is a struggle of our own lives too. Krishna had several strategic replies ready. First, he tells Arjuna that this war is not is his to fight because as a prince of the royal line, a kshatriya, a warrior, it is his duty to fight. Secondly, a dharma requires a retort. His kingdom has been wrongfully observed and despite efforts at reconciliation denied to his brothers. Third, the Kauravas have aggressively challenged them and as a warrior par excellence of the Pandavas, he has to take up arms. The joys of heaven await the warrior, whether he fights from the losing side or the winning. Arjuna counters by saying that he does not want the rewards of doing his duty. He doesn't want heaven, nor does he want the kingdom. He does not want to have the blood of his own kin on his hands. That is his justification. Krishna tells Arjuna that he only appears to have a choice. In reality, he doesn't. The divine has already drawn the entire shape of the scenario. The battle will happen. Arjuna will fight. All that remains for Arjuna is to choose why he wants to fight and the state of mind he enters the battle with. If he thinks he will fight, he will be fighting his relatives and will incur sin and bad karma for killing them. Then, says Krishna, he will indeed be killing his relatives and will accumulate sin. If he thinks he will be doing his duty, the duty of the Kshatriya to protect his people and his kingdom from an unjust leadership or an intrusion, then he will be doing his duty and be rewarded appropriately for fulfilling his duty. Krishna then shows him yet another angle of approach. Arjuna can accept this battle as the divine will. Then all he will be doing is obeying the orders of the divine. He will not be fighting for good, for vanquishing evil, or for performing his righteous duty. He will just be submitting himself to the will of the divine, as represented in the words, the hukum of the Lord. The beauty is that in such obedience, Arjuna will not be fighting for rewards. So he would escape the news of karma, which becomes binding only when one is entangled in its supposed fruits. Krishna then shows him that the war Arjuna is thinking of not participating is in has already happened. Not only does the disciple have no choice, but he has already participated in it. With this vision that the Lord's grace gives him, Arjuna comes to terms with what is his destiny. What he has expected to do had already happened as far as the divine was concerned. Arjuna was neither the killer nor the defender. Both the killers and the killed were two sides of the same coin of the divine Leela. In each individual war warrior, it was the divine that had fought, lost and won. Arjuna thus realized that he was not the doer. The divine within the was the agency of all actions. For Arjuna, it was Krishna all the way. Just as for us, it should be Guruji all the way. We have nothing to do with the karma. It does not even touch our hands, provided we realize that Guruji is working through us. We are not the doers. Guruji is. Basically, we accumulate karma, good or bad, not because of what we do, but because of our identification with what we do and the intention with which we perform our actions. An apparently excellent cause 
with an evil motive cannot lead to a good karma. The burden of karma is subtle to determine, but interest in doership can and will give you the burden of karma. Suppose there is a saint who's, who is sworn to telling the truth. He's medita meditating in the forest when an animal walks past him. Minutes later, a hunter goes past asking if his prey had crossed by. The saint now has the choice of telling the truth and condemning the animal to death or lying to save a life. The intention is most important. It is the saint, if the saint wanted to save a life, then telling a lie would not matter. His telling the truth would have made him responsible for the killing of an innocent animal. Do you think in that situation, being truthful would have added to his account of virtues? Karma is like the clothes we wear. While our body represents the soul, the quality of the clothes identify us as a person for everybody else. If I wear nice clothes, I'm identified as a nice person. If I wear dirty clothes, I'm not identified as a nice person. If I wear body-hugging clothes, they feel like an integral part of my body. I will be identified with them closely and they will become an extended part of my body. If I wear them loosely, then this problem does not arise because I will feel detached from my clothes. Whenever I want, I can remove my dress and put it away. So the key is to wear our karma like loose clothes. We are wearing them, yet we are not carrying them with us. They are not an extension of our body. That feeling comes when we stop identifying ourselves with what we do as compared to what we feel inside. We will only start feeling more when our Guruji will reside inside us. That will happen when we cede control of him. We will still go about doing our karma, still carrying out karma like wearing loose clothes because that is every human being's lot. But we will not be defined by our karma. We will be defined by our Guru. That is why Lord said that we should give up everything before coming to him. Have you ever wondered how surrender can happen? We start by diso disowning our karma, simply saying, I am not the one who does these things. It's my Guruji who makes me do them. The moment we take away our authority on them, on what we do, we stop doing it. From we doing it to it happening to us is a very subtle line that divides the two. And that line is sketched by what, we, what you think. If we think ourselves as doers, then these are our karma. Then we will be held accountable for them. If we think we are doing our duty and we do it well, we get a reward. But if we think we do, we do nothing, because all that is being done by, done is being controlled by Guruji, then we actually do nothing at all. We will not be held accountable for what happens through our life, ourselves. The same action can be led to punishment or reward, depending on how we associate yourself with it. A doctor conducts surgery on a patient and in the process, a patient dies. But you cannot accuse the doctor of killing that person, can you? He was trying to save the patient's life, but he couldn't. If the same doctor knew that he was not good enough to treat this patient and still decided to undertake the surgery with the knowledge of his limitations, he would be held accountable. So the same karma can, be diff can have different attributes and lead to diff different results. In our case, we simply leave all of this doership, intentions, thoughts, and other actions itself to Guruji so that all our karmas become an offering to him. By my actions, good, bad, or ugly, I don't care. My Guru is the boss. I don't know what he makes me do because I do nothing. Whatever I do is because of what my Guruji makes me do. That thought is surrender. Read again what Lord Krishna said to Arjuna. Give up everything and come to me. We too should give up all our other supports and reach out for Guru, Guru's support only. As the Shabbat beautifully points out, puts it, Ik takya parosa tere charnada, or sabe 
ਟਾਈਆਂ ਟੇਰੀਆਂ ਆਈ ਹੈਵ ਲੈਟ ਗੋ ਆਫ ਆਲ ਅਦਰ ਸਪੋਰਟ ਇਨ ਫੈਕਟ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਇਜ਼ ਮਾਈ ਓਨਲੀ ਸਪੋਰਟ ਆਲ ਦ ਰੈਸਟ ਆਰ ਐਟ ਬੈਡ ਬੈਸ ਟਾਈਮ ਬਾਊਂਡ ਐਂਡ ਇਲਿਊਜ਼ਨਰੀ ਸਰੈਂਡਰ ਮੀਨਸ ਥੈਟ ਆਈ ਹੈਵ ਡਨ ਆਲ ਆਈ ਕੁਡ ਡੂ ਐਂਡ ਨਾਓ ਆਈ ਹੈਵ ਟੇਕਨ ਰਿਫਿਊਜ ਐਟ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀਸ ਲੋਟਸ ਫੀਟ ਆਈ ਹੈਵ ਡਨ ਅਵੇ ਵਿਦ ਏਵਰੀ ਅਦਰ ਸਪੋਰਟ ਇਨ ਮਾਈ ਲਾਈਫ ਆਈ ਹੈਵ ਕਮ ਟੂ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਵਿਦ ਨੋ ਬੈਕ ਬੈਕ ਅਪ ਆਈ ਹੈਵ ਨੋ ਵਨ ਐਲਸ ਟੂ ਗੋ ਟੂ ਨਾਓ ਮਾਈ ਗੁਰੂ ਨੋਸ ਥੈਟ ਇਫ ਹੀ ਡਸ ਨਾਟ ਟੇਕ ਕੇਅਰ ਆਫ ਮੀ ਥੈਨ ਆਈ ਐਮ ਡਨ ਫॉर ਮੀ ਥੇਰ ਇਜ਼ ਨੋ ਆਲਟਰਨੇਟਿਵ ਟੂ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਆਈ ਗੋ ਵੇਅਰ ਮਾਈ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਟੇਕਸ ਮੀ ਆਈ ਐਮ ਵੇਅਰ ਮਾਈ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਇਜ਼ ਐਟ ਐਨੀ ਗਿਵਨ ਟਾਈਮ ਐਂਡ ਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਇਜ਼ ਮਾਈ ਡੈਸਟਨੀ ਵੀ ਆਲ ਆਰ ਲਾਈਕ ਦ ਬੋਗੀਸ ਆਫ ਅ ਟ੍ਰੇਨ ਦੇ ਆਰ ਟਾਈਡ ਬਿਹਾਈਂਡ ਦ ਇੰਜਨ ਐਂਡ ਦੇ ਗੋ ਵੇਅਰ ਐਵਰ ਦ ਇੰਜਨ ਟੇਕਸ ਥੈਮ ਬੋਗੀਸ ਡੋਨਟ ਹੈਵ ਦ ਲਗਜ਼ਰੀ ਟੂ ਚੂਜ਼ ਵੇਅਰ ਟੂ ਗੋ ਦੇ ਕੈਨ ਚੂਜ਼ ਦ ਇੰਜਨ ਆਫ ਕੋਰਸ ਇਫ ਦੇ ਗੈਟ ਹੁਕਡ ਟੂ ਦ ਰੋਂਗ ਇੰਜਨ they would reach the wrong destination briefly what is important is our intention what happens in our life is controlled by a supreme power that divine is in us does what he does if we think we are doing it then we are doing it and we will either pay for it or be rewarded for it if we think we are simply obeying a divine order then we will have nothing to do with whatsoever with actions and their consequences it is as simple as that that is why inner purity is important no matter what we do we do it with a clean heart guruji emphasized this when he quoted the ancient maxim which says man changa te nal ke mein ganga if your heart is pure then even tap water becomes as pure as the water from the sacred ganga don't associate yourself with your actions offer each action to the lord or guru every time saying as you wish let your will prevail lord krishna had outlined a simple tactic by which we can do away with the consequences of karma but what about karma which has already been committed this world of ours and our destiny is a by product of karma a simple couplet from ramcharitamanas of sant tulsi das puts it brilliantly karma pradhan vishwa rakhi rakha rachi rakha jo jas karhi so tas phal paay chakha as we sow so shall we reap the seeds we put in the land will grow into fruits we cannot plant a cactus and expect mangoes as the manas hints this earthly world is where our karmas come due to and have to be settled our accounts get settled in the physical world because actions take place in the physical setting after our dues are settled here we progress quickly in the spiritual world in the military each promotion must precede a tough and demanding tenure on the battlefield face to face with the enemy our excellent performance in peace postings will matter little in front of in the front line tenure ends up in a fiasco our performance matters the most when our life as well as the life of those we command is at grave risk this earthly existence of ours is akin to a posting on the front line our motivation is coming here is to settle our accounts as much as we can do better improve get closer to our chosen ishta or guru we have volunteered to come down here to make things right not to repeat mistakes and then promise to return once our karmas are accounted for and settled our performance in this physical plane will decide if we get a promotion or demotion in the spiritual world a peace posting so to say on our way it is a near impossible task sorry on our own it is a near impossible task with the great risk of ending up worse off than before one comes to settle karma but ends up accumulating more the lucky ones are those who are taken into refuge by a guru who is capable of taking on their karma he helps his devotees navigate the many fields fine field in the war zone all the while holding his hand he first makes his devotees blessings ready by settling his earthly accounts and then blesses him this process of becoming blessing ready will include enduring some pain 
and suffering under Guruji's guidance and watchful protection. The extent of the suffering, of course, depends on the devotee's karmic backlog. On that account, even the best of the best are a bit of a sticky, on a sticky wicket. Each one of us volunteers to this field posting for a single purpose, to get rid of the karmic load. But once one is born in this world, one forgets all the promises made to the Lord. There is a Shabbat that Guru, Guruji made us listen to at the Empire State many times. The essence of it was that you have forgotten all the tall promises you made to the Lord or the Guru. While in the womb, you promised that you, you were going to take his name, sing his praise, purify yourself and do all the right things. And look at you now, you are in a mess. You have forgotten all that. Thankfully, we have Guruji. He will not let us make mistakes. If he sends us out on a field posting, he will make sure we don't do silly things. That is exactly what Shri Krishna told Arjuna when the disciple asked him, Lord, what happens to your disciples, your devotees, when they deviate from the right path and make mistakes? Do they fall out of grace? What do you do with them? Lord Krishna tells Arjuna, he does not let his devotees fall from grace. A true guru is ready to pay back for the disciple's karma from his own account. When Guruji suffers for us, he's paying from his own account for everything that we had done because we are bankrupt. He settles our account. It's like having a line of credit from our guru's account to our account. No matter how much is spent, it will be replenished or as long as we are a devotee in a state of surrender to the Guru. Having said that, we also need to take responsibility for our subsequent deeds. Guruji takes so much on himself because he cannot bear to see us suffering. Our Guruji is the Supreme Lord, the Divine Light, and he holds our hand through thick and thin. He will ensure that our karmic account is settled as per his plan and not in accordance with our efforts. All we need to do is to hand over control to him. How do we settle our karmic account? Good karma is like money deposited in a bank account, while bad karma is like a debt. Imagine that every time we do something good, our deposit goes up. Every time we make a mistake, we spend the money we have. We may end up spending so much money that there is not only zero balance in the account, but we actually owe the bank. That is where the problem arises. It has to be paid back. The account has to be settled. This settlement of karmic debt is chiefly done through suffering. Even people come in our life to settle their own karmic dues as much as we enter their lives to settle ours. Only the guru enters our lives to settle our karmic account, not his. He enters our lives to make us blessings ready for spirituality. Another way of cancelling karmic debt is by creating a huge positive balance through selfless seva. For example, if we serve the elderly and lessen their sufferings, we will be receiving their blessings. Their sufferings have given them the capacity to bless us. Similarly, a suffering poor can bless us too. Ability to bless stays only with those who endure suffering. A mother's blessings are most valuable because her sufferings is usually more than that of a father. That is why mothers are held in great reverence in our lives. In a way, being a woman itself involves so much suffering. A woman in our life, when loved, respected and cared for, has a unique ability to make us blessings ready. One of the simplest ways to accumulate good karma and pay off our bad karma is to respect, love, and take care of women in our lives. Be it our mother, our wife, our sister, our daughter, our neighbor, or woman in our sangat. Guruji used to say that his blessed aunties first. He blessed aunties first because a lady devotee always thinks of her entire family. Male devotees think of themselves first. A father thinks that if he's blessed, he can take care of the family. A mother believes that her children, her husband, her parents, and in-laws should be blessed first, that her suffering is secondary. Since we have come to 
life already with so much karmic debt, it is important to not add more to it by asking Guruji to meet our demands. If we do not ask Guruji for anything, then we don't need to account for anything that we receive as blessings. Guruji will fulfill a need or beneficial desire his blessings even if he if we don't ask for it. If we seek a reward even for our good karma or seva, the fruit will be limited and perishable. A blessing is permanent. A Shabbat Guruji made us listen to explains this point. A pious person did tapasya or penance for over for 100 years. The divine was happy and spoke to the tapasvi offering a boom. The tapasvi straight away demanded a reward for his 100-year penance. The divine counseled him to think again. Do you want the reward for your penance or do you want my blessings? The deluded tapasvi insisted on the reward. The divine was about to grant it when the stone on which the ascetic had been sitting all this while acquired a human form and spoke up. It demanded that the tapasvi first settle its dues for letting him sit on itself for 100 years. Remember, every fruit we earn is not solely due to our efforts. There are many individuals and conditions that play their part to make it happen. The tapasvi quickly realized his folly and settled for the divine blessings. Because if he had to settle all the accounts he owed out of his penance, then there would be little left for him. As a disciple, we have to let Guruji handle all our matters. For what we have to give up self-interested actions and not ask the Guru. If the Guru is happy, he will simply give us his blessings and that energy will manifest as whatever we need. Therefore, all we have to do is to be with the Guru. Let the divine in us connect to the Guru and let it be. During my formative years, I received most of my spiritual understanding from my own namesake uncle, Sri Ram Kumar Sharma Ji, a highly evolved and awakened soul. He was my father's age and we shared an informal Guru Shishya connection. Whenever I, I was back home on vacation, we would be together for hours discussing the great loss lore of spirituality as passed down by our sages. This association lasted for over two decades and formed the backbone of my limited experience with the divine. One day he shared his complete learning of the divine in one sentence. He told me that after a lifetime going through the scriptures, sitting with the spiritual gurus and meditating, he finally understood one thing. There was no need to go through this process in the first place because there was really nothing to understand. He had to finally surrender to the divine, something he could have done a long time ago, right at the beginning. His only advice to me was to stop running around, seeking knowledge and understanding of the divine. There was nothing to understand, but everything to experience. Just surrender to the Supreme and let him take care of everything. It will happen when it has to happen. And he was so right. The divine happened to me when I was called by Guru Maharaj to his divine presence on February 18th, 2001. With that, my mind's quest for knowledge ended and my soul's experience with the divine began. Guruji advised his devotees to hand over the reins of their horses to him and he would always guide it straight. The horse is an intellect of our mind, the vehicle of our body. If we give this control to Guruji, we will think straight act straight and we will not accumulate any negative karma. As a result, we would become blessings ready and qualified to board his ship, traveling out of Sansara to reach him. In a short invocatory verse, the Brahadra Yaka Upanishad gives voice to the devotee's aspirations for his journey. Sangatji, my Sanskrit is not so good. However, asto ma sadagamaya, tamaso ma jyotir gamaya, prityo ma amritam gaya. Take us from untruth to truth, 
from darkness to light and from the bondage of moral morality to our eternal freedom. That is, devotees, devotion takes us from ignorance to knowledge and from separation from Guru to merge with Guru, Guruji, whence we become a part of him. Karma controls one's position in this endless cycle of life, birth and rebirth, hell and heaven. A surrender to the Guru's pulls devotees out of the cycle and accords him a permanent place in the Guru's lotus feet in perpetuality. Sorry, in perpetuity. Maybe, may we all be with Guru Maharaj always. He will never let us let go of us. He will trust, have trust and have and let him drive our chariot and we will be just fine. With this, I come to the end of the next chapter and I would like to thank Commander Uncle for sharing his anecdotes and blessings with us. On uh, reading these two chapters, I would like to say, Sangatji, that most of my questions were answered and I'm sure yours would have been answered too. So thank you so much, Uncle, for sharing this book with us. It's really a blessing for us. And we hope that we are all blessed with Guruji's choices blessings for years and years to come. Thank you, Jai Guruji, Shukrana Guruji, Bhul Chukmaaf Guruji. Jai Guruji, uh, many thanks. Gina Ante, am I pronouncing your name right? Hanji, that's right. Ma you can either uh, say Gina or Gina, both are correct. Ji <laughs> ji, beyant, 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 Shukrana Guruji Maharaj. Uh, thank you so very much, Gina Ante. You actually read from the heart and I'm sure everyone could just feel it through the words. And uh, yes, bohot, uh, bohot clarity, apni karmic journey ko leke, surrender, faith, action, intention. In sub points ko leke, itni clarity hui hai. And um, Commander Uncle ne bohot beautifully uh, Guruji Maharaj ke satsang ko versus ek devotee ka kya course of action in path of devotion vis-a-vis action and intention jis tarah se explain kiya hai i think it itself is so explanatory that none none of us can have further explanation to it thank Absolutely. you very much gina aunty and for this beautiful reading commander uncle thank you once again for this pearl this treasure that you've given us thank you suresh uncle for this initiative and thank you sat sangat ji uh, have a very blissful and peaceful night ahead and uh, guru ji maharaj ki aseem kripa unki rehmat hum sab par hamesha bani rahe aur hum sab sach ke raste par aur us raste par jis raste par guru ji chahenge ki hum chale sadev hum wahan chale and uh, thank you very much and ab aagya le sakte hain sangat ji